riddle, a noun. According to the Canadian English Dictionary, it means a question made puzzling to test one's ingenuity, an enigma, a puzzling thing or a person. And yet, back in the day, the earlier days of yore, uh, riddles were often a lot more poetic, a lot more almost like tales in a way to impart lessons to those who learned them, who knew the answer. And that is where this particular book that I'm going to be talking about today comes into. What book is that? You'll have to stay tuned to find out. Hello, and welcome to chapter 10 of book 1 of You Should Be Reading. Yes, we've hit the double digits now. I'm surprised at that myself. So, on to the book. What book? It's this one. Or this three, I should say. The Riddle Master Trilogy by Patricia A. McClip. There are three books in the trilogy, naturally. This isn't uh, by Douglas Adams, after all. Um, <clears throat> the first is called The Riddle Master of Head, spelled H-E-D. Uh, the second one is Air of Sea and Fire. And the third one is Harpist in the Wind. Now, this is going to be a little different than the other books I've covered because this, these three are ones that I have just finished reading this week. Uh, they're an older series of books. They were written many number of years ago. But they are still good today. One of the, one of the biggest... Um, <clears throat> sorry. One of the biggest uh, references that they people have talked about this particular book in the past. They've referred it to being a lot like Tolkien's work in a way. And the author herself has come right out and stated in the foreword of this particular collector's edition that she was influenced by Tolkien. She read those three books as a child and wanted to write like that. So there's a lot of similarities in that regard, but that's where the similarities end. Um, these books right here out of all of the fantasy that I've read and I've read quite a bit it has invoked in me a feeling of awe and wonder a feeling of the fantastical that anything could happen in the world that she has created uh, a lot of fantasy I find that I've read it tends to you've got a world where things can happen and it's it's laid down from pretty much in the first book or the first few chapters of the first book, you know, how things work in this world. You get a sense of it. So you get a sense when something that's going to be, some event is unfolding before you as you read, and you're going, well, I know that can't happen and that can't happen because the world doesn't allow it. It's, it's, it's structured in that way. Not, not so with these books. These books, to me almost read more like it was like I was reading a legend about the old gods for example um, the old Norse gods the old Greek gods uh, the old Japanese gods that used to come down and mingle with mortals and whatnot and pull off fantastic things turning into a bull turning people into a pillar of salt etc 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 all of these wonderful things and that's what this books, these books really have that feel to it, that you're you're reading about a legend about those type of people, not about an actual fantasy world. Even though you are, it is an actual fantasy world that you're reading about and the lives of the people within it. 
but it has that that fantastical edge, that fantastical feeling to it, that is really really quite amazing. Um, what's it about? Well, it's about the prince of a small island nation called Head, H-E-D, um, hence the name of the first book, The Little Master of Head. He is the land ruler of it. Now, one specific thing about the world that she's created here is that there are a number of nations involved, a uh, number of countries, if you will, uh, nations, what have you, and each one of these places has what's called the land rule. And the land rule is a magical binding between the person who rules that nation and the land. And each nation is different. Each nation's bindings are different. There's one nation called An, where the binding of the, the king of An basically has him keeping the dead in their graves because otherwise they'd get up and fight old battles. It's not like that in any other part of the world, just that nation. Um, but Head is a very small island nation. Uh, probably, I would guess from the look of things in the map, about the size of Prince Edward Island. It's, it's small. You could probably ride across it in uh, a day if you're terribly dawdly. <laughs> but it's a very uh, agricultural area. It's a very peaceful area. The peace of head is something that's talked about with, you know, kind of reverence in a way. Um, it's sunk into the land. It's, it's part of the people there. And this prince of head, uh, Morgan, is the ruler of the place because his parents died about a year past. I think maybe a couple. Um, and But he has gone to um, a college just across the ocean and studied riddle, master, studied riddle mastery. Now, riddle mastery and the tenets and whatnot of riddlery in the book are different from what we know as riddles. Like, when I think of riddles, I think, you know, you know children's riddles. Um, why is a raven like a writing desk? And uh, what's black and white and red all over? These sort of things. This is not how riddles are put in this. It's very much like the older, the definition of a riddle. It is a question with uh, an answer. Uh, they tend to say that there is a stricture to a riddle, which is kind of a formal answer about that riddle, as well as what the lesson is from this riddle. And usually the riddles are tend to be tied to uh, the lore and the history of the land, of a certain person, of a certain place, of a certain thing. And this is what the riddles will be. And it's, it's not exactly magic, but it definitely has its own purpose in the, the story as a whole. And there is magic. Um, it basically revolves around the fact that um, Morgan of Head has three stars on his face. Uh, it's a birthmark that he was born with. And nobody seems to know what those stars mean. And yet they are part of his destiny. And they lead him off the island of Head and into the great big world. Uh, along with the harpist of the High One. The High One being this kind of immortal, almost mythological being that rules over the entirety of the realm and can dispense justice on anyone as he sees fit. And the harpist of the High One is a man named Death, spelled D-E-T-H, uh, but pronounced like the word death. Uh, that's actually one of the riddles in the book that uh, quite a long time ago uh, there was a a landowner or a, a person that owns a house that invited him in but he had been cursed that if the next person to visit him did not give them his name he would die. 
So when death came to this guy's house, he was invited in, and no matter what this man asked of him, he gave it to him, except every time he wanted his name, he wouldn't give it to him, he'd only say death. Because the two words sounded alike, the landowner didn't realize that, and ended up dying because he believed the curse was affecting him because he believed he didn't have the name. Died of a heart attack. This is kind of the way Riddlery works. But it's it's an amazing series. It's very, very well written. Uh, kind of kind of an older style of writing in a way. Um, very Tolkien-esque in how the, the realms are described, how magic is described. It brings that sense of wonder to a book, uh, to a reader. The magic, there's a lot of uh, shape-shifting magic involved. There's a lot of other types of manipulation of the elements involved, manipulation of the dead, and just some really crazy out there things. <clears throat> and all three books sort of uh, revolve around Morgan of Head, even though the second book deals with a woman named, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but I believe it's Raiderly, something like that. I'll put the name up. But she, the second book is from her point of view as she goes looking for Morgan. So it's, it's really interesting. I would highly recommend this particular series of books to anyone who can find it. Uh, I'm not sure you can find it in single editions anymore unless you hit the used bookstores. This is the Omnibus edition. Uh, check out uh, any of your online bookstores, uh, Chapters, Indigo, uh, Barnes & Noble down in the States. I have no idea about anywhere else. But check around those online bookstores. They're bound to have some copies somewhere. I don't think it's that long ago that this has been published. Maybe a year or two. But yes, check it out. The Riddle Master Trilogy. So, uh, what else is there to say? Well, not too much if I don't want to get into spoiler territory. And I really don't. Because I thought I knew where the series was going, and yet it surprised me pretty much every turn of the way. Things happened that, you know, I'm like, well, this isn't going to happen because this isn't the way fantasy goes, but things went. It was really interesting, really refreshing to read something like this that put the put the fantasy back in fantasy writing. Thank you, Patricia A. McKillop, and thank you to all my watchers, visitors, whatever you want to call yourselves, and I guess this wonderful 10th episode, I will leave you with this, if I can find it. Morgan of Head met the High One's Harpist one autumn day when the trade ships docked at Toll for the season's exchange of goods. A small boy caught sight of the round hulled ships, with their billowing sails striped red and blue and green, picking their way among the tiny fishing boats in the distance, and ran up the coast from Toll to Akron, the house of Morgan, Prince of Head. There he disrupted an argument, gave his message, and sat down at the long, nearly deserted table to forage for whatever was left of breakfast. The Prince of Head, who was recovering slowly from the effects of loading two carts of beer for trading the evening before, ran a reddened eye over the tables and shouted for his sister. But Morgan, said Harl Stone, one of his farmers, who had a shock of gray hair, gray as a grindstone, and a body like a sack of grain. What about the white bull from Anne you said you wanted? The wine can wait. What, Morgan said, about the grain still in Wyndon Amory's storage barn in East Head? Someone has to bring it to toll for the traders. Why doesn't anything ever get done around here? We loaded the beer, his brother Eliard, clear-eyed and malicious, reminded him. Thank you. Where is Tristan? Tristan! What, Tristan of Head said irritably behind him, holding the ends of her dark, unfinished braids in her fists. Get the wine now and the bull next spring, 
Cannon Master, who had grown up with Morgan, suggested briskly, were sadly low on hair and wine. We've barely enough to make it through the winter. Eliard broke in, gazing at Tristan. I wish I had nothing better to do than sit around all morning, braiding my hair and washing my face in buttermilk. At least I wash. You smell like beer. You all do. And who tracked mud all over the floor? They looked down at their feet. A year ago, Tristan had been a thin, brown reed of a girl, prone to walking field walls barefoot and whistling through her front teeth. Now she spent much of her time scowling at her face in mirrors and at anyone in range beyond them. She transferred her scowl from Eliard to Morgan. What were you bellowing at me for? The Prince of Head closed his eyes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bellow. I simply wanted you to clear the tables, lay the cloths, reset them, fill pitchers of milk and wine, have them fix platters of meat, cheese, fruit, and vegetables in the kitchen, braid your hair, put on your shoes, put your shoes on, and get the mud off the floor. The traders are coming. Oh, Morgan, Tristan wailed. Morgan turned to Eliard. And you ride to East Head and tell Wyndon to get his grain to toll. Oh, Morgan, that's a day's ride. I know. So go. They stood unmoving, their faces flushed while Morgan's farmers looked on in unabashed amusement. They were not alike, the three children of Athol of Head in Spring, Oakland. Tristan, with her flighty black hair and small triangular face, favored their mother. Eliard, two years younger than Morgan, had Athol's broad shoulders and big bones, and his fair, feathery hair. Morgan, with his hair and eyes the color of light beer, bore the stamp of their grandmother whom the old men remembered as a slender, proud woman from South Head, Lathe Wold's daughter. She had a trick of looking at people the way Morgan was gazing at Eliard, remotely, like a fox glancing up from a pile of chicken feathers. Eliard puffed his cheeks like a bellow and sighed. If I had a horse from Anne, I could be there and back again by supper. I'll go, said Cannon Master. There was a touch of color in his face. I'll go, Eliard said. No, I want... I haven't seen Aaron Amory in a while. I'll go, he glanced at Morgan. I don't care, Morgan said. Just don't forget why you're going. Eliard, you help with loading that toll. Grim, I'll need you with me to barter. The last time I did it alone, I nearly traded three plow horses for a harp with no strings. If you get a harp, Eliard interrupted, I'm on a horse from Anne. And I'll have some cloth from Heron, Tristan said. Morgan, I have to have it. Orange cloth. Also, I need thin needles and a pair of shoes from Isaac and some silver buttons. And what, De Morgan demanded, do you think grows in our fields? I know what grows in our fields. I also know what I've been sweeping around under your bed for the six months. I think you should either wear it or sell it. The dust is so thick on it that you can't even see the colors of the jewels. There was a brief, there was a silence, brief and unexpected in the hall. Tristan stood with her arms folded, the ends of her braids coming undone. Her chin was raised challengingly, but there was a hint of uncertainty in her eyes as she faced Morgan. Eliard's mouth was open. He closed it with a click of teeth. What jewels? It's a crown, Tristan said. I saw one in a picture, in a book of Morgan's. Kings wear them. I know what a crown is. He looked at Morgan, awed. What on earth did you trade for that? Half of head? I could keep going. It's one of those books, but I won't. I'll leave you with that. The Riddle Master Trilogy from Patricia A. McKillop. So, have fun. Have a good week. I'll see you next week. And remember, you should be reading.